Puss in Boots. A miller died, leaving three sons to divide his fortune among them. The eldest took the mill and the land around it, the second took the flocks and herds, and then there was nothing left for the third son, Jack, but three bits of silver money, and a little cat that lived in the mill. This is all very well, said Jack, and the cat is a fine little cat and can feed on the mice it catches, but I do not see how I am to live on three pieces of money. Oh, answered his brothers, you will have to start out in the world and do the best you can for yourself. Jack took the little cat and started out. Do not be uneasy, master, said the little cat. You have three silver pieces. Take them and buy me a little pair of boots and a bag, and I will make your fortune for you. Jack did not like to spend his money on a pair of boots for a cat, but he knew he was a wise little animal, so he did as he said. He went to a tailor, and for the three pieces of silver the tailor made him the prettiest pair of little boots that ever were seen, and when Puss drew them on they fitted exactly. The tailor also gave Jack an old bag that lay in the corner, and for which he had no use. Puss led Jack off into the country, and then he bade him sit down by the roadside and wait for his return. The little cat ran off into a wood nearby, where there were a great many rabbit holes, and there he managed to catch two fine fat rabbits. He put the rabbits in the bag and trotted away in his neat little boots until he came to the king's palace. There he asked to see the king, and a cat in boots was such a strange sight that he was at once brought before his majesty. The courtiers nudged each other and laughed when the cat came into court, but Puss marched up to the king and bowed low before him. Your majesty, my master, the Marquis of Carabas, has sent you a present of these two fine fat rabbits for your supper, said he, and he took out the rabbits and presented them to the king. The king was very much pleased. He ordered a piece of money to be given to Puss, and bade the little animal thank his master for the fine present he had sent. Puss ran back to where Jack was waiting, and gave him the piece of money. There, he said. That is enough to pay for a bed and a supper at the inn. The next day Puss set off for the forest again, and this time it was a pair of fine fat partridges that he caught and carried to the king. They are sent by my master, the Marquis of Carabas, said Puss. Again the king sent his thanks to the Marquis, and gave Puss a piece of money which the little cat carried back to his master, and it was enough to buy Jack food and lodging. So it went on day after day. Every day Puss caught some fine game in the forest and took it to the king with the compliments of the Marquis of Carabas, and every day the king thanked the cat and gave him a piece of money. The king began to wonder who the Marquis of Carabas was and where he lived. He began to think the Marquis was a very generous fellow. One day the king went out for a pleasure ride with his daughter, and many of his court rode with him. Puss came in haste to his master. Come quick, he cried. We have done well enough so far, but the time is now come when I will make your fortune. The cat then led Jack to a river, where he knew the king would pass before long. He then bade Jack take off his clothes and hide them under a rock, and then stand in the river up to his neck. Jack did this, though the water was so cold it made him shudder, and he did not know how Puss was to make his fortune in this way. Puss waited until he saw his master well in the river, and then he ran to the road along which the king was coming. Help! Help! he cried. Oh, help! My master, the noble Marquis of Carabas. He will surely drown. What is the matter? asked the king, stopping his coach, and the princess and all the courtiers listened. Oh, your majesty, cried the cat. My noble master! He was attacked by robbers and they robbed him of everything and threw him in the river, and unless he receives help he will surely drown. The king was very much concerned. He at once sent courtiers to draw Jack out from the river and dress him in robes of velvet and satin and gold lace. Jack had never been so magnificently dressed before, and he looked a fine fellow indeed when he was brought to the king. His majesty was so pleased with Jack's looks that he made him get into the coach and sit beside him, and the princess was even better pleased with him than her father. Meanwhile the little cat had hurried on far ahead of the coaches. Presently Puss came to a field where the harvesters were harvesting the grain. Puss marched up to them scowling fiercely and bristling out his whiskers until he looked twice as big again. The harvesters were frightened. Listen, men, cried Puss. The king will soon come by this way with my master, the Marquis of Carabas riding beside him. If he should ask you to whom this grain belongs, answer that it belongs to the noble Marquis of Carabas. If you do not do this you shall be torn into pieces, and the shreds thrown into the river. The harvesters were more frightened than ever. They promised to do exactly as the cat bade them. Then Puss ran on until he met a drover driving a great herd of cattle. Him, too, he frightened so that he promised if the king asked him to whom the herd belonged, he would say to the noble Marquis of Carabas. A little farther on the cat met a shepherd with his sheep, and he also promised to say his flocks belonged to the Marquis of Carabas. So it went on, 
it seemed as though everything was to be claimed by the Marquis of Carabas. Now all these things really belonged to an ogre who was very rich and fierce and strong and terrible, and after a while Puss came to the castle where the ogre lived. The little cat was not afraid of ogres, however. He made his way into the castle and ran along into one room after another until he came to where the ogre was sitting. When the ogre saw the little cat in his fine shiny, creaking boots he was so amused that he laughed aloud. He had never seen such a sight before. And where did you come from, my fine little cat? He asked. Oh, from over the hills and far away. And what do you want here? I only wanted to see you because everyone says you are the strongest and most wonderful ogre in all the world. When the ogre heard that he was much pleased, for he was very vain. Well, and now you have seen me, what do you think of me? He asked. Oh, Puss thought he was a very wonderful ogre indeed. And was it true that he had magic powers, too? Yes, the ogre had magic powers. Can you change yourself into animals if you choose? A lion or an elephant for instance? Asked Puss. Oh, yes, that was easy enough. I should like to see you do that, said the cat. Well, the ogre was willing to oblige him. At once he turned himself into a lion, for he really had that power, and he was a very terrible looking lion indeed. He roared and lashed his tail and his mane bristled. The ogre changes himself into a lion. Puss was so terrified that he sprang through the window and scrambled up the roof, though he almost slipped and fell on account of the boots. There he sat spitting and trembling. Then the ogre turned himself back into his own shape, and he laughed and laughed. Come back, Puss, he called, I will not hurt you, but now you see that everything they told you was true. Puss came scrambling back into the room, and he looked very meek and timid. Yes, I see it was all true, he said. But, Mr. Ogre, could you turn yourself into a small animal as well? That must be a great deal harder. Could you turn yourself into a mouse? Yes, the ogre could do that, too, and at once he turned himself into a mouse, and ran, scampering gaily about the room. But he did not scamper long. Peas SST. With a bound puss caught him and swallowed him down in a moment before he could even squeak, and that was the end of the ogre. Meanwhile the king and the princess and Jack were rolling along together in the fine coach and talking pleasantly together. The king was so pleased with Jack's talk that he told the coachman to drive slowly, so they could have the more time together. Presently they came to the field of grain where the harvesters were at work. That is a fine field of grain, said the king, and he leaned from the coach and called to the harvesters to know to whom the grain belonged. To the noble Marquis of Carabas, answered the harvesters. The king turned to Jack. My dear Marquis, why did you not tell me it belonged to you? I had forgotten, answered Jack. Soon after they came to the drover. The king admired the herd of cattle and asked the drover to whom they belonged. To the noble Marquis of Carabas, answered the drover. The king turned to Jack, and complimented him upon his herds. He began to think the Marquis must be very rich. Then they came to the shepherd, and it was the same thing, his flocks belonged to the Marquis of Carabas. In the forest the woodsman said the wood belonged to the Marquis. It seemed as though the Marquis were richer than the king himself. At last they came to the ogre's grand castle, and the king asked Jack to whom it belonged. Before Jack could answer the doors were thrown open, and the little cat ran out into the road. Welcome, welcome, your majesty, he cried. Welcome to the castle of the Marquis of Carabas. So this is where you live, said the king. Yes, this is where I live, answered Jack. The cat invited them to alight and led the way into a long dining hall. There the servants had prepared a magnificent feast, for now they, as well as the castle and everything in it, belonged to Jack. The king and the princess took their places at the table, and Jack sat between them. They ate and drank and feasted to their heart's content, and the king had never tasted more delicious food, and it was all served on golden plates far finer than those he ate from in his own castle. At the end of the feast the king turned to Jack and said, My dear Marquis, you must be a very rich man. I am so rich, answered Jack, that I really do not know how much I have. It seems to me, said the king, that you ought to marry a princess, for no everyday girl would do for you. Yes, Jack would like to marry a princess, but it would have to be the right princess. Then how would my daughter do? asked the king. At that Jack was ready to jump out of his skin with joy, for the princess was so sweet and pretty that he loved her already. Yes, she would do better than anyone else in the world. And the princess did not say nay. So Jack went back with the king and the princess to his own palace, and then the princess and Jack were married, and lived happily ever after. The little cat lived in the palace with them, and always the softest cushion, and the warmest corner by the fire were left for him. 
As for Jack's brothers, when they heard of the good fortune that had come to Jack, and how he had won a princess for a wife, they wished they had kept puss and given him the mill and the flocks and herds. 